Thank you very much, Mauricio. It's great to be here and I really appreciate your having me. There's a lot to talk about in global markets uh, and it's actually sort of an exciting time. Ralph, the US presidential election is two months away. Today, COVID-19, social unrest, and market rally have dominated the news flow. But it is expected the election to start taking over the headlines with the two opponents formally nominated. What is the outcome you think the stock market is currently pricing, if any, and how that compares with polls and bets that are in favor of Biden right now? Is it the same scenario that rates and the dollar are discounting right now? With the election, we often see pre-election volatility in the U.S. Now that volatility uh, is often much more elevated when the equity market believes that the incumbent president, and this year Trump, is going to lose. The way that we like to think about it is the, the market is pricing in the uncertainty of a new president. Now, the polling this year has been very, very, I don't know if I, uh, unique in that earlier in the year when COVID dominated the headlines, Trump's approval went way down and the expectation was is that Biden would win the election easily. More recently, as the social unrest, as you mentioned, has, has been more of a focus, uh, Trump's approval ratings have gone up and the, the likelihood of a Biden, uh, I would say an easy victory for Biden, has gone down. What we see there is that, you know, most, most people that try to predict these elections believe it's too close to call. Um, that being said, uh, you know, we did begin to see some of the equity market volatility today uh, that we expected. Um, we, we, you know, this isn't a surprise for us. We've had the market going up pretty much in a straight line um, for the better part of three or four months. So a little bit of a give back is not a surprise. Uh, and we can talk about what, um, what, what a Biden win would mean for markets as well as, as a Trump win. Um, just quickly, in, in terms of thinking about the dollar and rates, um, you know, what we've seen, which has been interesting, is the dollar actually declined by about 10 or 11 percent, and I'm thinking about the DXY, uh, from March. And that was really more to do with Fed policy and the significant easing and quantitative easing that the Fed has initiated um, since that time. Last week or so, we had the Fed announce its uh, inflation averaging policy for an equity investor and I guess a, a, a currency investor. That just meant that rates are gonna be lower for longer. Uh, in, in conjunction with that, I think a lot of economists are expecting the Fed to expand its QE policy in the next couple of weeks. And what we've actually seen is the dollar has, has gotten a little bit stronger. Now, why might that be? Is maybe some people are beginning to price in um, the possibility that the Fed disappoints with QE, or um, there are those that see a Biden presidency uh, as, a, a, uh, as a presidency which will be characterized by big spending. Um, right now, the Democrats and Republicans have not been able to agree on a new stimulus package for the U.S., and the feeling is, is that if Biden is elected, that will be one of his first initiatives. And so that would be dollar negative. What we have seen over the past week or so is a little bit of dollar strength. And that might be, uh, you know, a couple of things. That might be the potential disappointment with QE. That might be the fact that we haven't gotten this big fiscal package, what they call the phase four agreement or the phase four stimulus uh, post COVID. Or it could be um, uh, Biden's uh, sort of chances of success going down a little bit. I see. And what could it be, in your opinion, the main effects on the US economy and stock market if Biden wins the election? What are the main risks? Do you consider that the worst case scenario could be a contested election as the Bush versus score in 2000? The first thing to consider is I think that markets view Trump as a uh, better for equity markets. Uh, he is a, he has cut a lot of regulation. He's allowed businesses to merge and do different things despite having uh, some, of, some of the CEOs from the technology companies in front of uh, the, the, the Senate and Congress. They really haven't done anything. Um, I, I think he's protected them and, and, and been a, uh, 
a, 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 a strong force behind corporate America uh, in general. So I, I think that when we think about Biden or a Democrat, you think of higher regulation, maybe protecting workers more, which you know we think is a good thing, but from a corporate cost standpoint, um, might be a negative. And then I think most importantly, one of the things that, that Trump did is he had a massive uh, corporate tax cut, uh, which added about 20% to S&P 500 earnings uh, over the course of, of time. Uh, Biden has said not, that he wants to eliminate that. So when we look out to earnings uh, over the course of the next year or two, uh, we can expect, we would expect that earnings would get back to their peak levels from 2018, 2019, which for the S&P 500 overall, were about $164 a share. And if we were to sort of roll back those tax cuts, uh, and, and in fact, have corporate tax increases, we think that that could be a big hit to earnings and bring them down to about $150 a share. So, uh, you know, a Biden presidency, while there would be a lot of good things and there would, there would be offsetting spending, we do recognize that the corporate tax cut and maybe the regulatory envir environment wouldn't be great for equities. It's also important to note that right now we're trading at a very premium multiple in the S&P 500, roughly 22 times. Um, it can be justified when we look at uh, fixed income levels. The 10 year is at about 65 basis points. And you sort of take out that, that equity risk premium. And we're right at the, which is really the difference between PEs, uh, S&P 500 PEs or, or valuation levels and the 10 year. And we're right at about the average that we've been at in terms of that equity risk premium in the quantitative easing era. So what, what that means to us is that future growth in equities is likely going to have to be earnings driven rather than come from a future of further multiple expansion. Uh, again, in a Biden presidency, we think that a corporate tax hike will impair those earnings or, or actually cut those earnings rather than uh, helping them grow, which may be a challenge. Now, in terms of a contested election, this is something that uh, is, is getting more and more of a focus. And the reason is, is that Trump has basically said, listen, if we have a number of mail-in ballots, a number of people going to the post office to send in, in, in their votes, there's a chance that this election uh, can be um, uh, tampered with. And so he's already said, you know, we might contest this election. Uh, in the Bush-Gore 2000 election, what we saw was and, and I didn't fully remember this, but by September, literally September 1st was the peak in the market of, of 2000. But, and we had actually gone right back to those March 2000 peak dot com bubble levels by September. Um, but the election and subsequent contesting of the election sent the equity market down 30%. And, and my best guess would be is that that conspired with the high valuations, the Fed, the dot com bubble to really begin the, the, the real sell-off. Now, we are not expecting a dire scenario like that, but it should be noted that a contested election would lead to uncertainty. This would be a big negative. There is not an easy way to resolve a contested election in the US. Um, and we think this would be a big negative uh, for the equity market. And I would say that the closer the polls are and they have become close, the greater the chances for a contested election become. Uh, so it is something that we're watching. There are also characteristics in today's market um, that are not completely dissimilar from the market characteristics in 2000, such as the peak in early September. We saw a big sell-off today. Uh, we have to see how this plays out. That's clear. And Ralph, in the last weeks, we have seen more consensus view favoring European stocks, mainly because valuation don't see appealing in relative terms in the US market. Additionally, this week Mr. Buffett announced a big and unexpected bet on Japanese trading hold goals. Considering that since coronavirus triggered the sell-off in March, the S&P 500 not only recovered all of its losses, but also posted new record highs. In that sense, what are your target level and tactical view for the S&P 500 for the next 12 months? What are the sectors you expect to outperform the index? In terms of European stocks, 
we still see that as a value trap. Um, one of the reasons why is we think that the euro is going to continue to get stronger, and that is a headwind to European corporate competitiveness and European corporate earnings. Um, we've seen many European houses make this same call of going overweight European equities for the past five or six years. Uh, it has never been a good call. Um, this is, has not become a time for value. We still see growth dominating. And Europe is dominated primarily by value companies. The one other thing I would leave you with is we all know that the market leaders have been tech companies and they are tech companies, whether those are in Latin America, whether they're in Russia, whether they're in China, or whether they are in the US. What we've noticed is that the makeup of the European market has a very low level of tech companies relative to other parts of the world. Uh, and again, if we're gonna focus on that sector, it just doesn't favor Europe. Now, in terms of Japan, we saw Warren Buffett's move not so much in investing in uh, about $8 billion in five trading companies in Japan. We didn't see that as a bet on Japanese equities. What these really were, were trading companies that would benefit uh, from higher commodities prices. And so you can say, this was maybe more of a bet on a weak dollar, higher commodities prices, potentially a stronger yen than it was on Japan as a whole. Um, we don't think it's indicative. We've been following Japan for some time, and I think the Japanese equity market is still 40% or so below its 1989 peak. Uh, it's still waiting for a uh, sustainable recovery in our view. Um, we also have the challenge that with the prime minister in Japan is switching over. We continue to watch the company, their country, um, but still think it's too early. Within our global asset allocation framework, we continue to favor U.S. and emerging market equities and continue to um, underweight Japan and Europe. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Mauricio, thank you so much. It's been great to be here. Uh, I hope to be there in person soon. Uh, and uh, please don't hesitate if you have any questions. Thanks again. <laughs>